So my name is Maura mcginty Kloss, and I am happy to welcome you to the uh, NAC, our Natural Areas Association 2023 webinar series. I'm Director of Programs and Communications, and um, NAA is pleased to be partnering with ESRI for three usually practical and informative programs, of which today is the third. And today we're going to be joined by Sunny Fleming, who's the ESRI Industry Lead, Public Sector Environment, and Emily Nielsen, Senior Product Manager, ArcGIS Hub, and Hershey Donapati, Product Manager, ArcGIS Hub, relating to maximizing volunteer impact with ArcGIS Hub. However, before we get started, I would like to take just a couple of minutes for those of you who might be new to the Natural Areas Association. NAA is a national nonprofit organization that serves practitioners who manage ecologically significant landscapes to protect biodiversity. Protecting natural areas in perpetuity requires quality science to inform practice and access to reliable resources. NAA provides science-based content for natural areas practitioners and researchers seeking applied science and practical solutions and knowledge transfer related to the management of natural areas. We share a suite of programs designed to achieve on the ground outcomes and to encourage practitioner participa participation, especially with one another. If you'd like to learn more about NAA, we do have the QR code to our website, and you can also email us at info at naturalareas.org. All right, so let's get started. So before I introduce our speaker, I would like to go into a few housekeeping items. So we encourage you today to participate in today's session posting comments in chat. If you've got additional resources, we welcome those and we will save them and share them with the recording. If you have any questions, however, please post those in Q&A. You should see both of those options at the bottom of your screen or in your Zoom controls. And that way, uh, Sunny will be facilitating the uh, discussion and she'll be able to keep track of the questions and any questions that do not get answered today, we will make sure they are answered in writing and they will be posted. And, and honestly, on occasion, they'll even, if your question is so individualized, Esri will reach out to you directly. So please feel free to use that Q&A function. And now I want to introduce um, our facilitator for today. Sunny Fleming is ESRI's industry specialist in public sector and environment and conservation, and she'll be facilitating today's program. She has a background in plant ecology and botany and has applied location intelligence throughout her career. From monitoring species in the field of the heritage botanist to helping state parks manage recreational assets across their systems, she continues to pursue her passion for environment by championing, now championing, Esri's large user community of environmental professionals. And I joke with, with um, uh, Sunny that she needs to start the Where's Sunny program because she's <laughs> everywhere. So Sunny, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I'm seriously considering starting that or getting a little globy and putting it around like a, a yard gnome and taking pictures of where I'm at. So <laughs> great idea. All right, I've gone ahead and I have shared my screen to get us kicked off today. I wanna to thank everyone who's joined us and thank you, Laura, a special shout out from my friends at the Southeastern Grasslands Institute. I definitely appreciate that. You all are doing incredible work along with all of our other environmental professionals that are on the call today. So this is the third part in a three-part webinar series. And I wanted to, let's go ahead and progress. There we go. So this is maximizing our volunteer impact with ArcGIS Hub. And we've designed the webinar series in such a way that we wanted to show a progression. And that first webinar was just an hour long. It was just me yapping along, but really talking about why we need to be looking at geography and a geographic approach when we're tackling invasive species issues. But then really, how do we use those tools? And so working with field maps, doing our field work, kind of conducting that bread and butter work that we're all familiar with, but then really taking it to that next level, looking at something like ArcGIS Hub that our community may be a little less familiar with on how we can take advantage of our volunteers, of our citizen science community, and of our external stakeholders that we may have to collaborate with. So that's really this progression, and that's what today is about. Now we know um, the agenda if you're familiar with how we did it last time, we're going to do those introductions and expectations super quick. 
and really launch into this hub demo as quickly as possible because we want those questions coming in and we want to be able to answer those um, as best as possible live and then as Moira said we'll follow up if we can't get to all of those I'll be facilitating that Q&A and I can chat a little bit about funding opportunities as well to help support this work but the challenges we're facing and I've given the spiel um, at both of our previous webinars you know we have about roughly 6,500 non-Indigenous species here in the United States alone. These are impacting our water quality, um, access to water. They lack this predation. They can exacerbate all sorts of issues. They become these monocultures. They decrease biodiversity. I'm speaking to the choir here, and this is why it's so important that we can scale our impact. I am just one person. You are just one person, and we really need help to tackle this really important work. We know that those funding cycles can be erratic, sites can be remote, notebooks can be lost or destroyed, all of those things. We need help, right? This is why we can take advantage of something like ArcGIS Hub and our community to really put those boots on the ground and make a big impact here. So why Hub in particular? You can enroll volunteers with Hub. So really it's this engagement platform and I'll let our product specialists get into this more specifically but it's really around that engage and educate, which is a requirement for almost every single grant opportunity I've ever seen. It's that need to engage and educate. So using Hub supports the requirements of those grants that you all are tackling. It provides consistent data collection, regardless of who's using it. So whether it's us as professionals using these tools, or you're able to disseminate those tools to your citizen scientists, to your volunteers, um, so that they can enter that data in a nice, clean, consistent manner. They get those immediate results. You know, volunteers, they're amazing, right? They're putting themselves out there to do this work. And it's so rewarding to be able to show them immediately how that impacts the program at large. And with Hub, you're able to do this. You can track those volunteer hours. That can be turned into grant match. We know that a lot of these grants require financial match and that sometimes volunteer hours are um, able to be used for that grant match. So you're able to do that much more easily through something like Hub. And again, it's all about scaling your impact, being able to do more of this important work that we're doing here as environmental professionals. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our product team. Today, I have Emily Nielsen. She's the senior product manager and Hershey Dandapati, our product manager, they work together and they've put together a great program for you all today. So you all please take it away. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Sunny. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Da, da, da. There we go. All right. So hello. Um, so thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, as Moira and Sunny queued us up, uh, we are going to be talking about, for this third installment in the webinar series, how to maximize your volunteer impact using ArcGIS Hub. So who are we to start off with? Uh, well, my name is Emily Nelson, and I'm Senior Product Manager for ArcGIS Hub. I've been with Esri for almost two years, um, and I was working in the environmental nonprofit space for many years before that. And so when Sunny approached us to do this webinar uh, series, I was really, really excited because it's getting back into the topics that I am so passionate about. Um, I live in Denver, Colorado, uh, and I spend most of my time outside. Uh, this is a hike up in Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, one of my favorites. And uh, when I was on this hike the last time, I was sitting there with a friend right on that rock having lunch. And this cute little critter came up right in back of me. Uh, this, this is a Martin, and uh, they're very, very elusive. And so I was so thrilled to be able to see this cute little guy. Um, also love doing uh, work to give back to the outdoors, and so I do a lot of volunteer um, trail restoration and work with some really fantastic organizations here. Uh, but one thing I wanted to share, and this is a bit of a quiz for you, if I'm able to, I don't know if I'm able to see the chat, but I'll see if I can bring up the chat in a second. So another thing I love doing in Colorado uh, is working with uh, a local organization and I get to hike to beautiful places like this, uh, scramble up into the talus here, and I'm looking for evidence of a certain creature. And so I'm keen 
Let me know if you know what that creature is. Oh, I've already seen something coming through in the chat. Perfect. Yes. Uh, so right on the right hand side there is a, is a hay pile. And these are created by, oh my gosh, yes, the Colorado Pika Project. Okay. So these are created by these adorable little creatures. So these are pikas. And uh, I've been volunteering with the Colorado Pika Project. There's a call out in the chat. Uh, so have a look at that. If anyone else on the call is involved in this, um, you guys are amazing. Uh, but it's a long-term community science initiative to monitor uh, the impacts of climate change on these adorable little creatures. And so each summer, uh, my friend and I are pika patrollers and we go up into the mountains and we set up our plot area and we look for evidence of, um, of pika. Um, and ideally we can see some. So these are some of my photos when I've been lucky enough on hikes to see these little guys. So anyways, just a quick intro to myself and I am going to now pass the screen sharing over to Hershey. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Hershey Dundapati, and I'm a product manager in the RHS Hub team as well. I've been with Esri for about three years almost now. Started off as an intern, really love the company, love the impact the company and this product in specific is having all across the globe, really. So I uh, kind of came back after my master's and I've been with the same team since then. So I'm originally from India. I did my bachelor's in civil engineering, a master's in environmental engineering, and I have been pretty close to nature myself in a way that I try to experience it in different formats, uh, whether it is getting lost on a Mount Rainier when I'm snowshoeing, getting out of the path, and almost thinking that that's going to be the last place I ever will be or is it or jumping into a cenote in Mexico so I've been someone who has been very active very close to nature and I've been involved in Seattle in a lot of retreats um, where we just have no technology like in the sense like we don't contact anybody we just are there with our peers, climbing, um, you know, ladders, climbing trees, and just getting really up close and talking to people. This is a way we build emotional um, intelligence with our peers. So I've been involved in um, a lot of that. But I, but I always say I have uh, two phases of my life. This is this was one phase, and the next phase of it is now when I moved to California, and all I'm doing is thinking about how all of those little poppy fields can be potential forest fires in the next year. So I live in Orange County. And although we love the rain, we love every, everything that the rain brings. We are also very much uh, concerned about what it means when there's no more rain next year. And I have a tiny little son. He's two years old and he's already been on multiple hikes and rock climbing adventures with mommy. And our hope um, as parents is to make sure that he is comfortable getting up close with nature, getting up close with animals, getting up close with just environment and making sure that he can understand what it is to live in a world that's kind of you need to protect. You need to make sure that everybody lives um, you know, happily together. So he's actually even snorkeled uh, in the ocean. We took him to Florida and we put him, dumped him in an ocean. In all fairness, he thought it's a swimming pool, but there you go. Um, it's fine. He survived. But yep. So that's a little bit about me and Emily. And what we do every day is work on this product called our GIS Hub. So to start off, let me go through the quick agenda. We, we will be covering um, what our GIS Hub is, just giving a very high level brief about the product and what the multiple licensing levels are and what are some of the capabilities that you get with each of those licensing levels. Then we'll be shifting focus uh, to talking about sites and open data, which Emily will be leading. And then I'll shift gears to talking about Hub community which is where we bring all of this together. We bring how can you share your information and data and enable your volunteers to come find you and help you maximize your efforts in invasive species removal. And all of that is going to be done through identifying some of the challenges that Sunny just mentioned uh, previously. And how do you exactly apply Hub into your workflows so that you can address those challenges easily? 
So before I jump into what Hub is, um, this is something that uh, me and Emily share in all of our presentations, because this kind of sets a really nice baseline um, to explain why we do what we do. Uh, we believe this is our mission. This is what we work towards. We want to enable communities to work together because that's what we believe to be the best way to engage and mobilizing them. You have your goals, you have uh, initiatives that you're working towards, but we believe that when you, your stakeholders, and your community come together to achieve those initiatives and goals, it's going to be so much better, right? You're going to maximize your impact. And that's what we believe. And that's how we envision Hub being used. So ArcGIS Hub is a cloud-based engagement platform that enables you to work more effectively with your communities. And when I say communities, I mean it very, very broadly. It could be residents, it could be business leaders, it could be NGOs, it could be universities, it could be anybody outside of your organization or outside of your core team that you want to start engaging with, that you want to collaborate with, that you want to share your goals with, right? Give them certain tasks to do, have them report back to you what the progress is. So really enable that sustained engagement. That's what Hub does. That's what Hub enables you to do. And ArcGIS Hub is built on top of ArcGIS Online. So if any of you on the call already have a subscription to ArcGIS Online, you can start using Hub today. So Hub Basic, like I said, is available with ArcGIS Online. And with that, you get the ability to create sites and pages, which are the foundational or the building blocks of a hub, right? That's where you share your information and data. And of course, you have our open data and private data capabilities. So all of this is available in the basic version. So once you kind of go ahead to the next level, that's the Hub Premium. With Hub Premium, you get a lot of inbuilt tools that enable two-way communication. It's not just now about you sharing data or you sharing information. It's about how your community members can come and find you, can have an identity in your initiative and start being in teams with you, sharing content with you, and maybe even creating their own content and helping you move your initiatives and goals further. And we also have something called ArcGIS Enterprise Sites. This is for on-premise implementations. But our focus today is going to remain on Hub Basic and Hub Premium and how you can use some of these capabilities uh, to address those challenges. And we will be walking through a number of demos and workflows to show you how you can do that today with Hub. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Emily now. Yeah, and so Hershey was talking about uh, those foundational parts of what ArcGIS Hub is, and a big part of that is informing and educating with ArcGIS Hub sites. So this is a hub site. Uh, you can see you can embed content directly into it, uh, like Survey123. Uh, you can have links to other surveys. We're going to be looking at this volunteer reporting and quite a bit of detail later on. You can embed dashboards, you can have statistics cards, embedded maps uh, directly from ArcGIS Online. Uh, you can put a bunch of text, like how to get involved in this great community, uh, photos and information, links to other resources, and you can have events as well, uh, which Hershey is gonna be going through later on. Uh, so hub sites are a great way to pull together all of this different content uh, coming from all different tools. Uh, so really leveraging that entire ecosystem of Esri products that you can bring into Hub, which is kind of like this umbrella. Uh, so we're looking at the homepage, you can have additional pages. Uh, so linked up in the header. So this is information on Bufflegrass, which is our focus for today. Uh, so again, again, some embedded maps uh, and links to other resources. Uh, we'll get a volunteer portal here. Uh, this is actually hidden on the public site, but if you're logged in as a volunteer, you can access this. Uh, and this has links to training materials to get volunteers uh, squared away before they go out and do some work in the community. Um, we've got these nice little FAQs. All of this is done without any code. Uh, so this is very easy. It's a drag and drop interface to be able to create all of these beautiful sites. And it's very, very simple. I did this in a matter of hours. So if you're logged in, you click that little edit pencil um, and all the stuff to build the site is here in this little layout editor. Everything's based on rows. Uh, so you drag a row out 
Uh, and you can edit that row. So you can set the background color, you can set the text color, you can have an image as the background, like in that row above it where it says combating invasive species. And once you have your row, you can pick any of these cards and use a, as you hover over them, you can see a description of each one uh, and you just drag them onto the row. Simple as that. Uh, so I can type in some text here, uh, but it's a really nice, simple drag and drop interface to be able to create these beautiful websites very quickly. There's a few other cool things uh, that come with hub sites. Uh, one of those is a custom domain. So out of the box, uh, we give you a URL uh, and the um, subdomain for that is hub.arcgs.com. You can set this to any custom domain you want. So just apply for a custom domain. You can configure that right here in the hub application. So if you want a .gov site, you can do that. A dot, if you have the permissions to do that, of course. Uh, if you wanna make a .org site, any custom domain you want, you can configure that right here. We've also got a bunch of tracking out of the box. Uh, so we have hub activity tracking that is um, gathered anonymously. I'll be showing where that comes in later, but you can also configure a number of third-party analytics tools like Google Analytics, Adobe Analytics. Uh, we just recently added um, support for site improve too. And if you're gonna be tracking any information about users, it's best practice to have a consent notice. You can make a purely custom one, um, but you'll see I toggle that consent notice on. And if I save that change I made, publish the site and then go in and check that page out, boom, there we go. There's that little consent notice. Uh, so again, very customizable, um, but it's a good practice anytime you're collecting any information about your users. And if they reject cookies, all that tracking does stop. And so it gives the users the power uh, to what information they want collected. Um, the other big fundamental part of Hub is its open data capabilities. And this is, ArcGIS Hub was actually born from ArcGIS open data. And so it really has its roots uh, in open data. This is an example Department of Conservation website. We'll be talking about invasive species today. Um, but if I click on one of these cards, say biodiversity, you'll see up in that search bar, it's already pre-populated that word with that search term, and it's filtered the results that I have in this content library associated with my site to just the relevant ones. We just added uh, this in the, in, in, in the product. Uh, we're now having a gallery view of that search, so you can see those beautiful thumbnails. Um, and then you can type in any term. We're going to be looking at uh, invasive species today. Uh, and this is the uh, centrist occurrence data set, uh, the occurrence uh, of that buffalo grass uh, that we were looking at um, from GBIF. And so you click on that data set and you can see it immediately on a map. And you can get all the information about this. Now, I will note, see in the top right, I'm not signed in. So anyone, if you have a public site, anyone can access this. Uh, we have a lot of uh, controls over permissions um, that people can access certain things, certain items of content, certain pages, um, but you can have a fully open data website to be able to get all sorts of users access to that information. And on this, what any user can do uh, is they can style and filter the data. Uh, so this data set has a lot of um, different columns associated with it. So I'm looking specifically for scientific name, put that filter in there and automatically you can see the styling done based on the scientific name. So if we check on that little legend button on the right hand side, you can see um, different types of buffalo graphs uh, that this data set has. And I can use that um, attribute in a filter as well. So I look for that same one and say I just wanna filter my data to just the centrist data. I can do that very easily. Now at the top, you see there's 13,000 records, but now it's filtered for 9,000 of those. I can filter it by the map too, which brings it down to 98. So the extent of the map that I see, I can use as a filter. And so if I don't wanna download the entire global data set, I can toggle those filters on and I'm only gonna be downloading those 98 records and I can download them in a variety of file formats. Another really cool way to filter the data on the map is to be able to draw your own area of interest. So I go over here to these map drawing tools and I just draw circles. So a lot of what we're gonna be focusing today is in Arizona. So I can just draw an area around Phoenix, filter to that area. Uh, I can set a buffer around it too. Um, so I've got a variety of units I can pick from, set any distance there. Let's just do a 10 mile buffer around this. 
little oblong shape that I just drew. And you see again, 139 of those records are filtered and I can use that again um, to be able to filter down and condense that download. So a few of the sites and open data capabilities, uh, but I'll pass it back to Hershey to talk about getting started with the Hub community. Right, thank you, Emily. All right, so like I said, with ArcGIS Hub Premium, you get the ability to establish two-way communication or two-way engagement with your um, communities or stakeholders in, at large. So let's understand how that looks um, conceptually and then dive into the demo aspects of it. All right. So what exactly is a hub community organization? So everything that Emily showed right now, that's the hub initiative that she set up, populated it with a lot of open data, a lot of cool information, all of that you will be setting up in your parent organization, right? And that's the main org where you and your staff members will be uh, present, you'll be uh, curating your data, you'll be setting up your initiative. But once you go to that premium level, there's an additional organization that gets connected, that gets stood up and connected to your primary org, and that's known as the community org. And this is where all of your stakeholders, it could be your volunteers, community members, um, you know, other NGOs, anybody outside of your organization can have a place to work and have an identity in that community org. And these two orgs are connected. When I say connected, it means you as the employee or you as the authoritative person can define who gets to be a member of this community org, what activities can they do in that org, right? And also, do they need any permissions um, to be a member of that org? And what sort of content can they create? Can they see certain parts of your hub site? So there's a whole bunch of permissions and activities that you can define for people who are a member of that particular community org. And I would like to say that anybody who's in that community org can be pulled into a team along with your staff or people from your parent or your employee org so that you can work together. So I'm going to show all of that in a couple of minutes here, but this is just a conceptual understanding of what a parent org is and what a community org is. Now, translating that into initiatives or goals that you're working towards. Like, like I said, Emily has set up that beautiful initiative within just a couple of hours. And all of that is contents that present in that parent org or in that employee org. But it doesn't mean that you can have only one initiative or one site that you can set up per org. You can have as many number of initiatives that you'd like, and all of that will exist or all of that will live in that particular parent org. And here you can see in that org, I've represented two different initiatives. One is for buffalo graph and one ruffle grass and one is for Japanese honeysuckle. So no matter how many number of initiatives that you want to stand up, you can do that in your parent org. And once you have volunteers who have signed up in that community org, they can follow or they can have activity that they they want to do in all of those initiatives, right? So it doesn't mean that if I've signed up to be a volunteer with your organization, I can only participate in one initiative. No, I can be a member of as many initiatives as I want. I can contribute in any way that I like. So that's the beauty of Hub, right? That's what we're talking about, scaling, ensuring that you can maximize your impact. You can get as many people to take interest in all of your goals. It's just not one. So that's how um, you can set up your hub organization for maximum impact and success. So what can anyone who's a member of that community org even do? There's a lot of things that they can do, but we'll focus on three main aspects. The first one is managing your community accounts. So anybody in that community org can go and set their preferences. Do they want to be private? Do they want to be public? Do they want to go in and see how they can set up a bio? They can share their interests with you. So they have their little own account that they're provided with and they can set it up however they want. 
and you can assign certain roles and privileges to them. And if you identify, say, there's Emily who signed up to be a volunteer, um, and she's really excited about Pythons, and she wants to do a lot more uh, to do with that. So she's your star volunteer. You can give her special privileges. You can give her special um, role in your hub so she can work alongside you to maybe set up a part of your hub site or take control of a certain project, right? So that's how you scale your impact. That's how you're giving out privileges to people so that they can go out there in the field, help you and come back and report it to you. And of course, the third part is shared private content. Says Emily has been given those privileges. She's out there in the mountains collecting data for Pythons, but she wants to share it with just you as organization members. She can do that because she's a member of that team. She can come back, share that content very privately with you. So these are some of the things that people in the community org can do. So let's kind of take um, a step back in time and revisit what uh, what Sunny has mentioned as challenges while addressing in invasive species. And this was, uh, I think, the webinar series part one, where she presented these four challenges. And um, almost, I would say about 80 to 90% of the participants said that Yes, all these four challenges are what they're facing today when it comes to addressing invasive species in their localities or in their organizations. So we thought that's a kind of a good way for us to um, kind of take this uh, demo forward and show how each of these buckets can be addressed with specific tools and specific functionalities in Hub. So let's dive right into it and see how the problem of human resources, that is finding people who want to come in and who want to do some volunteer work with you, can be addressed using Hub. So of course, there's community identities. That's what I've been talking about. You can set up that community org. You can have people come in, volunteer with you. But there's also something called partner collaborations that you can set up using Hub. If you have another NGO, or if you have a partner, or if you have any other organization who, who share your goal, they're doing similar work, but maybe in a different geography, you can set up a collaboration with them inside of Hub so that they can share data with you. You can share data with them. You can share information. And in fact, you can even share teams with them. So if you have two people from your organization who want to collaborate with a different organization, say, in a different locality, you can set up that collaboration with them and you can start working on these shared goals together. So that's how you can solve or you can address the challenge of human resources, making sure that you're reaching as wide population or as wide communities as possible. So this is a little demo uh, that walks you through how can you create call outs for volunteers? How can you encourage people to come in and find you and maybe say that, hey, I'm interested in this activity. So let me go ahead and be a part of it. So within Hub, you have the ability to turn on a button called as a follow button. That's that tiny little star button um, that you can see. And there's also ways that you can have an entire row that's dedicated to creating callouts. As you can see here, I've put out a tiny little row that, that says, hey, come on, apply to be a volunteer. So you just enabling people to understand why they're here and they can come and sign up. And there's a little survey um, that we have, uh, you know, set up here. So anybody who's coming in to volunteer, they can fill out the sign up form. They can indicate their name. They can give out some details about them. There's this person called Pam who is interested in volunteering and she's specifically interested in volunteering for buffalo grass removal. And you can even ask them for their area of interest. So if you can see, as Emily mentioned, we will be focusing on just Phoenix area. So I've set my extent there. And within Phoenix, Pam can come in and say, hey, this is my locality. This is where I will be volunteering. So it's as simple as that. And as soon as that record is submitted, you can go ahead and create an identity for them. But if someone comes in and clicks that follow button, this is how they can create an identity for themselves. You don't have to do it every single time. They can do it on their own as well. So they can use their social media along 
logins, or they can just create a hub community account by just giving name, email ID, and then boom, there is an activation email that's sent to them. And I do have a Gmail account that I just created for this purpose to show how the activation email uh, comes. So it's just within a matter of seconds, you get that email. Um, you click on that and it just asks you to choose a username. There's something people are not always comfortable using their full name. That's fine. They can choose their username. And as soon as they um, do that, as you can see, it's changed to welcome back volunteers. So they're automatically signed in and they're signed into that hub community account. So now Pam can go in, set up that user profile that I've been talking about, kind of dig into what teams she's already a part of. She clicked that follow button. So she's already a part of that invasive management followers group or team. And she can go in, edit her profile, add some information about herself so that her team members know who she is, what she's interested in, um, and even maybe add a photo if she likes. So it's just a lot of stuff that she can do to make that profile her own, right? And right from this view, she can go in and dig into a certain team. So let me see what this followers team is all about, right? She's just joined. She's a member of this team. She wants to know what is this team? And she goes in and she can see that there's already some content that's been shared here. So there's that volunteer portal, there's a lot who are the members, who's the owner, who's the manager of this team. So there's every single information that she needs is provided right in that user profile. So she can go in, start those interactions, start those conversations with people. So that's how um, a person, a volunteer can come in and find what's most relevant to them after they sign up. And as you can see right now, she has no notifications, but maybe she will get some notifications in a little bit of time. Let's see. All right. So like I said, you can always set up a survey to assess the interests of your volunteers so that they're not out there just thinking, what can I do to help? It's about like, hey, how can you enable them to help you better? So Pam has filled out a survey. She said that she is most interested in buffalo grass removal. So you as the authoritative person who has all of that information on what a person with interest in buffalo grass removal can do, can go look at that survey and go back to your hub site and start putting her in a team or teams um, that's most relevant to buffalo grass removal. So here we've created a buffalo grass removal volunteer team. I will be walking through the workflow, how you can do that, but I can go in because I already know she is submitted in the survey, what her name is. I can just add her uh, to that buffalo grass removal volunteer team right from here. It's just as simple as that. You can start grouping people for team management right inside of Hub. So how do you even create a team? I just showed you that it's really simple to add someone to a team, but how can you add, even create a team? So within Hub, there is an ability for you. You can start creating teams that either have just view access or edit access. Or if you have teams in a different initiative across your organization that you just want to repurpose, you can do that as well. So I'll walk you through how you can create a supporting team. So in here, just for demo purposes, I'm creating an edit team. An edit team basically has the privileges to edit any content that you share with them. So say I'm creating a buffalo grass removal volunteer team and any member that I will Will be adding to this team can edit any of the content that I'm sharing with them. So say you've shared a PDF document or you've shared a web application with this particular team, only these team members will have the ability to go back and view it as well as edit it. But if you want to just create a view team, that's possible too. So as you can see here, I just gave the name and description and bam, there's a team that's uh, formed. And I do wanna pull in my colleague, Emily, to be a member of this team. So I can just go look for her because she's already a member of my organization and bam, she's right there. So it's as simple as that. And there's a lot of settings you can do, like who can view this team, who can contribute to this team, and can this team participate in a discussion? This is a very interesting uh, capability that we'll be showing in a little bit here, but members in a team within Hub can now have threaded conversations with each other. 
around pieces of content. And you as a manager can um, decide, can they do this or not? And within this team profile, people can come in and add content. Like I said, for an edit team, any content that you share, people can edit, uh, not just view it, but edit it as well. So I'm looking for some content that I want to share with my volunteer peers. And there's this really beautiful photo that I took. Um, so I want to share it with these folks. I'm like, hey, guys, there's this photo that I took when I was on a trail. Um, so I'm just sharing that with my team. So this is all about the two-way communication. It's all about bringing people together, right, um, around content um, or around shared interests. All right. So moving along, you've created a team. You've identified people who want to be a part of that team. Do they have to go through that drop-down menu each and every single time to access that team? No. Within that layout editor, we, you also are given an option of a Teams card, which enables you to showcase the teams within your initiative right on your hub site. And I, all of the teams um, that you're showcasing on the hub site will respect the visibility that you have set for the team. What do I mean by that? So I'm the manager for this initiative. I'm the one who has actually set up all of these teams, which is why when I save it and when I publish it, I will be able to see all of these teams because I'm a member of it. I'm a manager of this team, right? And right after I view this team, let's take a minute, yep, right there. So right after I see that particular team, I can click on one of those cards and I will be directed into that team's profile. So you're taking teams from, I don't know, right inside of your hub and showcasing it on um, your hub site. So I sign out, now I'm gonna sign in as a volunteer and show you how uh, the view basically changes. I also have a volunteer. Uh, interest in buffalo grass, so I have created an identity for myself, and I come back into this hub site, and boom, there's only one card that I see. So I'm only a member of this buffalo grass removal team, which is why I only see that one card. And the team for Japanese honeysuckle removal has vanished. That's because the visibility has been set to only the Japanese honeysuckle removal volunteer team. So that's how you can create content that's kind of visible to just the members with the required permissions. All right. So the second challenge that we wanted to kind of address today is early detection. How can you enable your community members first to be aware of what invasive species are even and what invasive species do they look out for. And one of the ways in which you can do that is through the events capability in Hub, which I'll be walking through in a little bit here. Or you can also have feedback forms that you can um, set up right inside of Hub because Hub is integrated with Survey123 and share that all across your Hub site so that people, anytime they notice um, that there's, there's an invasive species or something while, right, while they're out in the field, they can just share that information directly with you. And of course, you can start team-based discussions. So say I and Emily are the organize organizers of this particular initiative, and we want to ensure we have maximum impact. We want to ensure that people are aware all across um, our city about the volunteer activities and opportunities. We can talk about that inside of Hub and do analysis to ensure we have maximum impact. And like I said, Cam can even see notifications. Now, I have gone in and added her to that buffalo grass um, removal volunteer team. So she, the next time she logs in, she has this tiny little notification. So it's not just about her coming and creating a profile. It's about her knowing what's happening, what's happening inside of Hub. What are some of the teams that she has joined and what activities can she do in that team, right? So now she comes in into this initiative. She's kind of scrolling through, absorbing all of this information, absorbing like, hey, what else can I do? What is the progress that has happened in this initiative so far? And um, as she scrolls down, she will land on something called hub events. So within hub events, people can go in and, yep, that's hub events. 
Um, so she, they can go in and start looking for events in their locality, in their neighborhood, and identify volunteer opportunities. Now she comes in and she, she sees that, hey, on June 17th, I'm free on that day, and there's an invasive plant patrol that's happening in my locality. So she, she figures this is a great opportunity to volunteer. This is a great opportunity to kind of go and attend and do what she wants to do. So she clicks on that attend button and boom, she's a part of that events attendees team. And she can even go ahead and add this to her calendar or share it with social media or just even send a link via email to a friend who might be interested in a similar event, who might want to join her. So that's how they're scaling that impact. And as soon as she goes in back to her user profile, you see the Teams has now changed to four, which means she's been automatically added to the event attendee group. And right from here, she can see who else is going to be attending this event. Can I share some content with them ahead of time? Um, do I message them? Do I let them know about, hey, I have been on this trail before. I have some tricks and tricks to share. So all of that is possible right from inside of Hub. And say me and Emily are now discussing like, hey, we did this event, but we didn't see a whole lot of volunteers show up from a certain part of our neighborhood, from a certain part of our community. So what do we do? So what we can do is start a discussion inside of Hub and so with discussions, people in a team can have threaded conversations that only those team members can see. So right here, I've opened up a, a map and I'm selecting a group. So I can search any group that I'm a member of, but I know that me and Emily are core team members and there's this special team um, that we wanna chat in, that we wanna talk in. I select that and I add a message like, hey, Emily, I've noticed that there's a decrease in the number of volunteers in this location. Do you maybe wanna do a separate event here? And because I've mentioned Emily, uh, she will be receiving an email and she can go and respond directly. And because, of course, I want to add geography or reference to which area that I'm talking about, I just draw, use one of the draw tools, add geography to my conversations, and bam, I create a post. Now Emily has received a notification and uh, she can go back and as soon as she responds, I can go in and see that I have received a response. There you go. I see that there's a reply. There's Emily. She's like, hey, yes, I I don't know why, but it would be great to have uh, an event here. So that's how you can have threaded conversations. And if she wants, she can even add another geography. She can say no, but a different area is going to be better. And if you want to do these interactions right on the map, that's possible too. So this is how members in a team can have conversations, can decide if your volunteer um, impact, right, is reaching your set goals or not, or what you can do to maximize it or enhance it. So now I'm going to turn it over to Emily to talk about the other two challenges. Yeah, so that third challenge uh, presented in the webinar was economics. Uh, so the more you can do with fewer resources, the better. Um, we're talking about ArcGIS Hub, but ArcGIS Hub is a place to bring together all of those different outputs that you, cre that, that you create using Esri tools. So dashboards and story maps and field maps and survey one, two, threes and all these things. And so we have all these tools uh, that you can leverage um, all in one system. And also the more you can create something that you can reuse over and over and over again with just a few little tweaks, the better. Uh, so we have the option to be able to use templates and to spin the, those up very, very easily and you can deploy them across your organization. So with just a few minor tweaks, uh, you can scale out, scale up your work. Um, and also the more you can leverage that volunteer network. So that connects directly to the human resources that Hershey was talking about and uh, showing some workflows for. Every hour a volunteer spends doing something is an hour less that you have to do. And so being able to really leverage that volunteer network is very powerful. So one of those examples, templatizing. Uh, so this is, again, back to our Department of Conservation hub site that I was talking about. Uh, we've got a few different pages up here. So state parks, water resources, forestry. Um, I've just stubbed those out for now, but this invasives page, uh, this combating invasive species page, 
is a great one. It's fully built out. I want to take this and just use this format and this layout uh, as a template for all the other pages that I want to create. So I can just save that as a template. And very quickly, this is spun up uh, into a template that I can deploy across the organization and make that forestry page look the exact same, swap out the images, swap out the text, boom, very, very simple. And speaking of being able to leverage that volunteer network, volunteers can create content. Uh, so this is uh, logged in as Elizabeth. Uh, she is a superstar volunteer. She is uh, a member of the Bufflegrass uh, removal volunteer team, uh, and she's just super, super motivated and ambitious. Because she has that community identity, she has access to ArcGIS Online. So she can go over to ArcGIS Online and she has a creator user type, which means she can create a whole variety of things. Uh, so as you can see, logged in there is Elizabeth or Lizzie, our volunteer. Uh, and she wants to create a story map because uh, she has been involved in a few Bufflegrass poll events around Arizona. And so she spins up with a few clicks um, and a bit of uh, text information on a story map on how to run one of these events effectively. So everything about logistics and safety protocols, even down to what participants should wear when they're doing a Bufflegrass uh, poll event. And she wants to share this with other folks on her team. So she can set the sharing level to organization, pick that volunteer team and click publish. And so story maps behind the scenes goes through and publishes that story. Now, she's made this story, um, but where does it go? Uh, so again, from ArcGIS Online, uh, she can go over to the little um, deployer right here and go into Hub, and she's brought immediately to her user profile, and check it out. There, her story map is directly associated on her user profile, so she can get to that super easily in Hub. Now, I, as one of the initiative managers, uh, I want to go in. I know that Lizzie created this great story map. I want to check it out. And so I go over onto the team that she told me that she added it to, and we can see her as a member on that team right there, and go over onto the team profile, which her she was showing before, and we can see that content there too. So all members of this team have access to that great story map that they can use uh, to learn how to run one of these events themselves. But what if I want to take it a step further? Uh, so I really, really like uh, Lizzie's story map. We have this volunteer portal page. And maybe you want to use that and showcase that on our page itself, along with our other training materials that we have. So I go in, search for that item, and drop it right into this gallery. And so you can see it pull right there. And that's Lizzie Storm map that our volunteer created. So I could publish that draft, uh, wait for the site to publish. And when I close out of the editor and have a look at this page, um, automatically right there. There it is. Uh, there is that story map that our volunteer created. So again, economics, it's about leveraging that uh, group of volunteers that you have to be able to create content and take some of that workload off yourselves. Um, volunteers are great to leverage, uh, but what about others within your own organization? Um, this is a change we made just very recently within Hub. Uh, before, when you had edit access for a site, you had, I'm um, sorry, when you had edit access to a page, you had edit access to the entire site. Uh, so that invasive um, management page that we've been looking at, um, all the different pages within it, like the buffer grass page, uh, the volunteer portal page. If you had edit access to one of those, you had edit access to the whole thing. We've split those apart now. So this is working through a workflow uh, where we've hired a um, a, an intern uh, and her name is Harper. Uh, she's really, really excited about Bufflegrass, and we want to include her and empower her to be able to do some work on our behalf. Uh, so I've made a new team for her. Uh, this is the Invasive Management Interns team. I don't want her to have edit access to the whole thing, just want her to have ed edit access to that volunteer portal page. So I go onto that page and edit the sharing settings right here. And so you can see I can change the group settings. Uh, so I'll just add a group. And in that little pop-up modal, I'll find the group that I was just looking for. So this is the Invasive Management Interns group. It's a supporting team with edit access. So she'll be able to have edit control over whatever is shared in that group. And so you can see that show up right there with edit access. So what does Harper see? Uh, Harper's our intern. 
And she's on this um, combating invasive species site. And you'll see on the left-hand side, there is no edit pencil that you were seeing when I was logged in. But if she goes to the volunteer portal, boom, that edit pencil now appears. So she only has edit access to that one page. So as Harper can go in, uh, can have access to all these layout cards, it can create content for this page, uh, she can edit and change anything there and having access to that page without the entire site itself. Um, and this volunteer portal, uh, this only shows up if you're logged in as an administrator or as a volunteer. I just wanna show you how that was configured. Uh, so right here, we look at the sharing settings specifically for this volunteer portal page. And you can see certain groups have view access right there. And those are those followers of the invasive management initiative that Hershey was showing before. So I'm not signed in right now. This is the public view of it. Uh, if I were to sign in as a volunteer, uh, as Lizzie, who would have been um, the one who created that really great story map, boom, that volunteer portal page shows up directly there. Our fourth and final challenge is quantifying effectiveness. And so in the world that we work in, um, there's that age old question, how do we know if we're having, having an impact? Um, we've seen you know, the rise of MEL over the past several years, because this is such a huge question. How do I know if I'm actually having tangible impact on the ground? And that's still gonna be a huge question, but we provide the tools to help you understand your effectiveness on the ground and to be able to quantify that. So whether that is showing visual progress of all the places that volunteers have been engaging, um, showing the number of uh, discussions that you're having with volunteers or discussions with the broader general public, uh, being able to track the impact, whether that is volunteer hours, like Sunny was saying at the very beginning, uh, we provide you those tools to be able to do that very easily so you can have a better understanding of the effectiveness you're having and the impact you're having on the ground. And one of those things uh, is volunteers being able to see their impact in real time. Uh, so first of all, the mechanics of this. Uh, so Hershey was showing before, there's different views, whether you're signed in as a volunteer or you're not. This is just the public site. I'm not signed in. So I see apply to be a volunteer. I see our progress so far. I see this cool dashboard. But if I were to sign in as a volunteer, that view changes. So again, signing in as our volunteer, Lizzie. Um, and you can see that welcome back volunteer uh, that uh, Hershey was calling out before in that gray row at the bottom. Um, but then you can see this row that just appeared and it has a call out to report your buffalo grass removal volunteer hours. So that's pretty nifty. I can sign a QR code to access that survey. I can click this link. Um, so I can do either one, depending if I wanna do it on my computer, on my phone. Um, and let's have a look at how that looks behind the scenes. So how I, as the initiative manager, set that up. So if I log in as the site admin or owner, I can go on to the edit and I can see that row that we were just looking at that appeared has a yellow rectangle around it. So it's highlighted in that yellow with a little note there, limited row visibility. And so, that is configured pretty easily on each row. And I was saying rows are the building blocks of these sites. So I'll show you if we just pull out an empty row, there's a visibility option down at the bottom of that list. And I can limit the visibility of that row to a specific group. And so Lizzie, our volunteer, uh, she is in one of those supporting teams. It's that Buffalo Grass Removal Volunteer Team. So anytime she is signed in, she'll be able to see that. And if we look at that row above, which I just demonstrated her being able to see when she logged in, we see that bill of visibility is set to that same team right there. Now, where's the impact part? Uh, so the volunteer, Lizzie, she's signed in and she wants to report some buffalo grass, buffalo grass removal volunteer hours. Cause over the past weekend, she went in, uh, went on a hike, removed some buffalo grass. So we can see in this dashboard, we've got 50, out, 50 volunteer hours reported so far, all the locations where volunteer work was happening. And I can see Lizzie's name right there. So Elizabeth Vollen right there. She's contributed two hours to this project so far. But over the weekend, uh, she did do some removal work. And so she's going to quickly take that embedded survey right there. Uh, and she just did this um, 
this month, uh, just over the weekend, so April 2023. This is leveraging the survey one, two, three. Um, which is, of course, um, as you know, another Esri product. Uh, we have a full integration of Survey123 within ArcGIS Hub. Uh, so you can create and manage and edit surveys directly in Hub without even having to leave the application. You could, of course, do everything in Survey123 as well and be able to leverage any of those surveys and the results and the analysis uh, within Hub too. So whichever you prefer. Um, but Lizzie picks that spot on the map uh, that she had done the removal for, and she noticed, uh, which I'll show in a minute, it wasn't on the map that she was looking at. Um, she was really surprised when she was on her hike uh, to come across this. So she filled in the survey, and then she scrolls back down on the page and check it out. The dashboard now on that top right says 53 hours because it includes those three hours that Lizzie had. And now on her name listing there, it says a total of five hours. So at the beginning, Sunny was talking about immediate results, tracking volunteer hours. This is a really super simple, I mean, if I can configure a dashboard, you can too, <laughs> super simple way to be able to get that immediate feedback of the impact that you're having as a volunteer. Uh, another part of this is volunteers being able to start a discussion. So Hershey was showing a discussion between her and I uh, as, as members of this organization, as employees within the Department of Conservation. But what about a volunteer? Uh, well, Elizabeth as a volunteer can start a discussion too. So you saw she just filled out that survey. Uh, she had found some buffalo grass when she was just on a hike in this area. She's looking at the buffalo grass occurrence data. There aren't any observations here recorded. And she wants to let uh, the initiative managers know that. So she's gonna draw an area on the map um, and let Hershey know that, hey, this data set should be updated. Uh, there's some buffalo grass that I found here. Maybe we can also have an event, uh, one of those buffalo grass poles, uh, to be able to reduce it in this area. So she just at mentions Hershey um, and says, hey, I was hiking here last weekend and I saw a bunch of buff buffalo grass. Uh, but Lizzie, as our superstar volunteer, uh, she is keen uh, to get involved and to help however she can. So she says, hey, perhaps we can actually have a buffalo grass pole event in this location. So she adds geography to that. Uh, so very similar to the area that she was drawing in that survey, um, just right within Hub, adds a discussion, adds this geography to that post that she created. And so she can add that to the post and create it um, just with a few clicks. And that at mention goes directly to Hershey. But what about on a mobile device? Uh, so our volunteer Lizzie goes out into the field again and she opens up that data set. She can see that little uh, one on the map. You see where that um, discussion that she had already posted, that post that she had created. And she was like, hey, I'm out here again. Um, I wanna add some more information so that Hershey as the mission manager uh, knows some more about this specific area. So, hey there again, I'm out here now and I estimate it's about 15 square feet worth. Um, I'm happy to lead a small volunteer event here to do that buffalo grass pull. So Hershey gets those ad mentions and she replies. Uh, and a day later, Elizabeth sees in her inbox uh, this email that she has been at mentioned by Hershey in response to that conversation. Uh, so she gets that, uh, that email. Uh, there's a link to go directly to that discussion. And so let's pop that open here. And you see there's a little number three on that area now. Uh, those are the, the two posts from Lizzie and then the reply from Hershey uh, saying, hey, yeah, you are truly our, our true vol our, a star volunteer. Uh, we can surely host a poll in that identified area. And so Elizabeth again responds and says, hey, I actually know of where there's a really good parking lot uh, that we could have. And instead of drawing a polygon, a shape on that map, I can drop a point instead. So you can do points, lines, polygons, any type of geography. You can add multiple geographies within this threaded conversation. And the last thing I will show on being able to track engagement, uh, track that effectiveness and being able to quantify that is on our dashboard. So when I was showing the analytics at the beginning, um, which 
showing that we track some anonymous activity on who is engaging on hub sites. As a hub site owner or manager, you have access to all that information. And so you can see for a variety of different time periods, this is the last seven days, how many views do you have on that site? Um, how many sessions have there been? How long are people spending on it? Um, how is that over time? And so it's a really good way to see really the, the effectiveness um, of the sites that you're putting out there and how people are engaging on them. We are going to be adding a lot more metrics to this over the next several months to really get deeper into how people are actually utilizing this. Um, what kinds of discussions are they being involved in? What topics are they interested in? And so we're gonna be building this out a lot more uh, to give you more insights into how your community is engaging. So those are all of our workflows. I will turn it uh, to Hershey one more time uh, to just very quickly show a few really cool features that are on the road ahead for Hub. Right, thanks, Emily. So all of the workflows that we shared right now is just, I would say about 10 or 20% of what's possible with Hub. Hub is a very, very broad product and you can customize it to get the maximum impact for your work. But we also are hard at work building more and more and more features that enable you to expand and maximize your impact. And one such tool that I'm particularly excited about is public discussions. Taking that discussions workflow that me and Emily demoed right now to a public uh, setting. So you're having those discussions in a team, but maybe you want to have a public discussion to pull in ideas from your community. Maybe you want to just put a board out there and ask, hey guys, um, what other invasive species or what other um, activities would you like us to host? How many more events would you like us to host? Or is there something that we can do more to enable you? So just really making sure that people have an opportunity to come back and give you feedback and, and let you know their ideas. And you can take this, absorb this, and either start an event, start a project based off of an idea. I mean, honestly, sky's the limit to what you can do here, but it's just about how are we enabling you with more and more tools to do so. So idea boards will be available uh, by UC, that's by July within the product to use. And one of the really cool things about idea boards is it supports anonymous participation. While we do encourage that community members come in and have that identity for themselves and help, maybe someone is just about, hey, I want to submit feedback. I just want to share an idea. I really don't have the time and space right now to go in and volunteer but I do want to do my bit, a little bit of sharing my ideas that's possible with uh, public discussion. So something to look forward to and include in your workflows. And the second one is projects. <laughs> so Emily walked you through how to create a volunteer page, how to create views or separately for each of the you know projects that you're working on. But very soon there will be an out of the box way available in Hub where you can spin up a project within a matter of minutes. So projects are templated and they're searchable and they help you track your impact towards your longer goals by helping you um, set small-term goals, which volunteers can work towards and ultimately help you reach that long-term goal. For instance, if your goal is to maybe do a poll in like four or five different geographical areas for buffalo grass, you can stand up a project page for each of those individual geographies, identify volunteers that are specific to that geography, and then track their volunteer hours, track how much buffalo grass removal has happened, and ultimately spin that up to your overall initiative of buffalo grass removal. So this is going to be available again by UC, 20, um, UC this year, so that's in July. And this also enables a collaboration with your stakeholders more easily. So now say Emily, or Lizzie, who was a star volunteer, who has shown that interest and in taking a bigger part in your initiative, can be set as the collaborator on a particular project. So she will have complete um, access to this particular project page, maybe track the impact herself, not to the entire hub site, but just to this project. So your economics um, and then identifying impacts and enabling uh, human resources, that's enabling more volunteers. All of those challenges can be addressed with projects. So again, 
something to look out for uh, as you're evaluating Hub. And a couple of other things I want to mention before we close out our demo for today. We have a lot of resources out there. So people who are not uh, yet familiar with Hub or who just now have this new interest in learning more about Hub, there's a bunch of resources you can go, you can dig into it. We do have a very broad um, gallery and this gallery is filterable. So if there's a specific, um, say, I don't know, category that you're interested in, you can go in and dig in and see some great hub examples right in there. And all of those are publicly accessible hub sites. So you can go in and dig into any one of those. And we have a newsletter that you can sign up for. And so you can also have a change log. Hub releases very frequently. We release every week. We give out enhancements, new features every Tuesday. Um, so if you want to kind of stay updated uh, to know a little bit more about the direction we are headed in as a product, please do go to that change log. You can get a lot of information there. And we have a very wide community in GeoNet. So all of your Q&As, you just have a question, you're wondering about something, you can go ahead and post there in the GeoNet. We are very active and try to respond there, but you also see that people jump in and try to respond to each other as well. So there's a huge community out there of hub users, um, always happy to help each other. So that's kind of our hub resources. So thank you guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for Emily. And now I'll turn it over to Sunny. Yes, we've gotten amazing um, questions that are rolling in. I've been scrambling to answer some of them live. We're going to make sure that we follow up to all of them. But for these last few minutes, so this goes to 1.30, let's get some of these answered live. So one of the first questions um, that I want to ask you all, there's a lot that came in, but this was an excellent one. It's really about being able to query volunteer profiles for like specific skill sets. So if they say, hey, I'm chainsaw certified or I am CPR certified or things like that, is there a way to do that? Um, I know I can think of ways, but is there something built in with Hub? Right. Uh, so I can take that. Um, so right now we are assessing ways to do that automatically. So say someone comes in and express their interest, how can we query that and add them to teams um, that are reflective of those interests. But today, what we have seen the most success with for organizations is using Survey123, setting up web hooks, which can automatically add folks to teams um, that address those interests. So yes, it is possible. It's not something uh, that they do right inside of Hub, but it's because we are integrated with Survey123, it makes that workflow really easy. And it also gives them a little bit more control, Sunny, so they can say what exact parameters are they trying to query, what exactly matches to that interest, and put them in those specific teams. It's almost as if our community comes to us with some needs and then we build that into the hub product. I love it. I love it. <laughs> we take our community very seriously, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> so I'm going to lump these two questions together because they're kind of similar, but um, I'll, I'll say it in a two part way. So when you or someone else adds data to the hub, can you automate letting the team members know that there's something new to see? And then conversely, someone's also asking if you can send out automatic emails when a, and when an event is scheduled. Yeah, I can take the first one and then Hershey can talk about the event one. Um, so right now, when you add um, content to that content library, so earlier in the presentation when I was showing all the, all the data sets and content items that show up, um, when you add content there, Currently, there's not a way uh, to do that automatically. Uh, you can subscribe to an RSS feed. Uh, so if you use some of those uh, aggregators like Feedly or anything, um, they're super easy to, to set up. I've, I have a test one going. You can get notifications when new um, content is added or when that content is updated. So that is a way um, using like a third party tool. And on every single hub site you see, um, there's a button to do that. So um, all the way in the bottom 
right there's a little option that says explore feeds and this is on any hub site and you can just click that and then have that link uh, to use directly in that aggregator like feedly so that is one way um you if you're yourself adding content uh, to that library and we didn't show this but there is a way to message all of your community members and so you can just shoot them a message directly through that so all the members of that team whether it is your group of followers uh, those who have shown interest and want to follow up what you're doing, any one of those volunteer teams that we were showing, uh, there is a way to send them a quick message. Um, so those are two of the ways for content that we have available right now, but Hershey can speak more to events. Sure. And it's pretty similar for events too. Like I said, with events, um, so it's two parts with events. Uh, there's events where you might have thousand people or like 500 people showing up. We've seen that with large cities and large counties. So you can turn that attend button off. Uh, so essentially there's no way to track how many people are attending. But for volunteer activities, we do encourage that keep that attend button turned on. So what that does is create a group behind the scenes, which I already showed you. And within that group, you can share messages, you can share, um, I don't know, like like maybe some content beforehand. So all of that messaging capabilities exists inside of those groups. So that's how people can kind of stay informed, know what else is happening. Um, and you can say, hey, there's a new event coming up, guys. So maybe you want to go register to one of those groups. So you can use those capabilities right now. Perfect. Thank you. So this question came really early on, um, and I believe, Emily, it was while you were doing the first demonstration and walking through that, you were showing a filter, and I can't recall if this was, um, if the page was being filtered based on the name or if it was data. So Melissa asked, is that filter set up by the user or the hub creator? Is it available out of the box when you explore the data? Awesome. Yeah, good question. And I'm just going to bring up um, a screenshot or yeah, the, the, the site just to show that. Um, Melissa, is this what you were talking about here? These filters on the side? I believe I imagine so. Okay. So yes. yeah, so this, um, this is all the content. So right now I have 21 content items in this library. These filters that show up here on the side, whether they're the type, uh, the sharing level, the tags, um, these are done automatically based on the items that you have in your content library. Uh, there's also uh, a source filter. So I'm right now showing um, our beta search view, uh, which we just recently released. But if you go um, here and yeah, I don't have this. Oh, sorry. I don't have it configured to the, to the classic view right now, but there's also a source uh, field that shows up. Uh, there's categories, so whatever categories you've established in ArcGIS Online, those come through. But to answer the question, yes, it's all done automatically based on the content item. So we do that all out of the box for you. Awesome. Um, this question has come through a couple times, and it, it relates a little bit to licensing, but folks are asking if there's a limit to the number of volunteers um, that can be part of a project or a hub or an initiative. Right. Very interesting question. So. The immediate answer is no, there's no limit. Um, we have licensing levels that um, that kind of fits all sizes of organizations, whatever is your reach, how many of your volunteers that you want to um, engage with. So it just really depends upon your needs and we can accommodate um, any of those. So we have different licensing levels, which yeah, happy to chat about after this webinar, if anyone's interested to know more. Yeah, right. and your your account manager at Esri uh, will be the best person to to chat about that too, um, and they can give a lot more information on like what your current uh, like subscription looks like and uh, what are the possibilities for for getting you those. But as Hershey said, uh, we scale to meet needs of all sizes of organizations. Ah, so this is I know other folks have asked this question before. Can an event be created and then scheduled beforehand. So this person specifically asked, for example, can it be scheduled for a reminder to be sent out 12 hours before the event, reminding people that they have registered? I know a similar take on this question also is if there's like an annual event that happens, can you kind of uh, have that automatic? So I'm uh, <laughs> adding to their question a little bit for you all, but yes. Good question. And so the there's no recurring events today. 
but we are building it right now. So what that means is you will have to set up that event and you can set that up however far in advance you want it to, and it will only populate on the calendar once you're kind of nearing that. So at a time you can display about six or seven events in this particular calendar view. You have different views. You have a calendar view, you have a list view. What I've configured here is a map view so that I can show all of the locations of those events as well. But um, the only way today to send out reminders would be through that messaging capabilities to the attendees. Um, so that's how reminders go um, to people. You can set up reminders, you can share content, like I said, uh, but there's no way to automatically set up recurring events yet, but that's an addition we are adding pretty soon. All right. Um, one, and I, I attempted, this is one of those questions I attempted to answer, but a couple people asked a little bit, they are enterprise users, therefore they have access to an enterprise portal and they can create enterprise sites. And they had some questions on, are there capabilities um, existing in Hub that they would definitely need to have ArcGIS Hub for, or can this actually all be built on an enterprise site as well? Yeah, that's a, that is a great question. Um, I'm going to, I know that's a little heavy. There's probably a lot of detail to that one, but that's totally fine. Um, I'm just going to pull up the slide because it's, it's always easier to talk, uh, to have a visual. Um, so going back to the slide that Hershey shared at the beginning. So we do have, um, kind of a cousin product, uh, called ArcGIS enterprise sites. And that has all the sites and pages capabilities and open and private data, just like ArcGIS Hub Basic does. Uh, there are a few uh, nuances uh, with differences between the, how the two systems work. Um, but in general, our approach is, and Hershey said we release product, we release updates to Hub every single week. It's a SaaS product. We can do that. We can get it like the code immediately out there. With an enterprise product, uh, they have two releases each year. And so anytime we release something for ArcGIS Hub Basic, uh, we queue that up to go into the next uh, version of ArcGIS Enterprise. Uh, currently today, all these premium features, so everything that is leveraging that community, uh, is only available in ArcGIS Hub, which is the one built on top of ArcGIS Online. Uh, but we are starting some very preliminary exploration um, on whether there is a demand uh, for being able to use some of those premium community features within a secure enterprise environment. Um, so whoever asked that question, if you'd like to chat more about that, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we can provide our email addresses um, in the in the chat as well, because I'd love to yeah learn more about your needs and see if for now your use case is like the sites and open data part is um, adequate, or if you're looking to do more of that community premium capability. All right, excellent. Um, this was also, I, I did answer this one as well. I've seen some examples of this, but I wanted to hear um, from the product team on this. You know, there are some organizations that have separate authentications. I've seen this with states where they have maybe a citizen program that authenticates. Um, so the question is, can you set up Hub Premium to tie into an existing, and they call out Open ID Connect login systems. That may be a specific technology, so I was unsure there, but I wanted you to kind of speak to how Hub Community Identities um, might be able to be set up with an existing authentication system. Yes. Um, Hershey, are we going to, I was just yeah. pulling up the doc link here, yeah. Right. So like I said, Hub, um, we are built on top of ArcGIS Online. So you have the opportunity to set that up with ArcGIS Online. So, and what, yep. So there is also a way that you can enable uh, or set up identity provider logins. And there's kind of this really simple workflow uh, that goes through that. But like I said, it's it's been done, but there's an out of the box way that's available with ArcGIS Online. Mm -hmm. So um, you can set that up. We've seen folks set that up, uh, but we do uh, like to say that again, it's the easiest through ArcGIS Online to maintain that kind of community, the community logins and all of that. So there you go. We can share this link as well in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you already did? Yep. So that, that's how you can set that up. But again, we do encourage 
uh, that people use ArcGIS Online out of the box, because that gives you a little bit more control. Excellent. I know we're getting really close to time. I think I'm going to ask one more question and then pass it to Moira to wrap us up. But the last question I want to ask, um, well, it's kind of two. One's a, one, they're both kind of softballs here. But um, one question is, if you have an existing website, which a lot of organizations do, what's a viable strategy here? And, and I answered this one live. I said I've seen both flavors where we've seen folks use Hub, you know, as their dedicated website, but oftentimes we usually see kind of a hybrid. But how about you all on the product team? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we, we do see a lot of hybrid approaches uh, where there's just a lot of linking back and forth uh, between like your, say it's an official like local government website, uh, but then you've got a hub site for all of that open data. So a lot of times we see uh, a lot of links built in to that um, original website, directing people to hub and vice versa. Uh, so I've seen folks who have links like in these um, pages up here, or maybe like tied directly to this little logo that take them to the official site. But best practices are really to have a lot of links back and forth. Uh, one thing we have been working on building is the ability to embed content. Uh, so we've got all these different, so we were looking at the layout editor, all of these are called cards. Uh, so these are statistics cards or we've got a map card or these text and image cards, uh, these galleries that we set up. And so one of the things we've been working on is the ability to embed this content directly. So like this gallery of um, applications here in another website. Uh, so that is something um, it's kind of longer term on that roadmap, but uh, we're rebuilding all of the cards in a way that they could be embedded in other places. Uh, so that is something that would also bring those two like different web properties uh, together in a more streamlined way. All right. And my very last question before we hand it to Moira, it's an easy one. Um, folks love your Buffalo Grass demo here, and they're curious if we can turn this into a public facing site, maybe with some demo caveats and share this out in our follow up materials for them to explore. Sure. I think we might have to uh, just chat a little bit about that, but uh, we can definitely explore uh, what's possible. And, and also we do have, um, we, we have a lot of inbuilt templates at the organization level as we build a lot of, lot of templates. We have a solutions team as well. So this is something that we can definitely pass along to the team and see what can be done, but absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I will say for, for citing purposes, so all the images that you see are from Unsplash, so they're all open source. The content uh, was largely generated from chat GPT. So <laughs> this is, there's a lot of, um, yeah, AI generated stuff here, which is very effective. Very quick way to build a demo. Making a demo site. <laughs> so, but yeah, I'm glad folks found it useful. <laughs> all right. Well, you all were awesome. Thank you so much for capping off our webinar series. I'm going to hand it to Moira to close us out. Well, I just want to say thank you for capping off our webinar series. This has just <laughs> been a wonderful opportunity to, to all work together uh, to, to just expand the work that we're doing and build on all the wonderful work that each of you is doing individually all around the country. So thank you for that. And I want to thank Emily and Hershey and Sunny for such great content today, for doing the demos. This has all been recorded. It will be sent to all of you in about a week. Anywhere we've got links, resources, the, a copy of the slides, you will receive all of it and it will be publicly available on NAA's YouTube channel. So thank you everybody. Thank you for being here. And we look forward to seeing you again at a future program. Bye-bye. Thanks so much everyone. Thank you. Bye.